In November 2017, the Zimbabwean military instituted a military coup against Robert Mugabe. We had ruled the Southern African nation for 37 years. The characterization of the Zimbabwean coup has been interpreted in many different ways. Some say it was a non-coup or a coup that is not a coup. Yet some say it was a coup with intelligent Zimbabwean characteristics. Some also called it a very Zimbabwean coup or a soft coup. And some say it was a smart coup or a special coup. Whatever the characterization or interpretation from the very moment it began with the army officer in military fatigues sitting at the Zimbabwe Broadcasting Corporation TV desk insisting that it was not a coup shows that this coup was indeed extraordinary. The reason is that the Zimbabwean coup did not play out like any other ordinary coups. Indeed, its leaders were at pain to explain that it was not a coup. To understand this, we need to go back and analyze the events that led to the coup, or not so coup. Welcome to Politicate Zimbabwe, where we give you political lessons about Zimbabwe's political landscape, looking at its history, its influential people, and by and large, its politicians. In today's episode, we look at the events that led to the 2017 Zimbabwean coup and how the coup unfolded. The coup, labelled by its protagonist as Operation Restore Legacy, was carried out ostensibly to bring back values of the liberation struggle and emerged out of ZANU-PF internal feuds. The ZANU-PF infightings emanated mostly from Robert Mugabe's refusal to retire. While there are many events that happened from 1980 until the coup in November 2017, explaining all of them is beyond the scope of this video. In this video, we are interested in the immediate events that led to the 2017 coup, and that is the division in the ZANU-PF party. ZANU-PF internal divisions were evident in the early years of the millennium's second decade. This was after years of the collapse of the social, economic and political environment of the country and the near loss of the presidents to the opposition movement for democratic change in 2008's disputed general elections. Perhaps let's start by looking at the first divisions in ZANU-PF post-2008 elections. Post-2008 election, there were two main camps in the ZANU-PF party. One faction loyal to Joyce Mujuru, the then vice president, and another faction loyal to Emerson Munangagwa. Both were senior members of the party and potential successors to Robert Mugabe. In 2011, Solomon Mujuru, Zimbabwe's first but then retired armed forces head and spouse of the vice president, Joyce Mujuru, burned to death in his farmhouse. General Mujuru was well known for trying to assist his wife to take over from Mugabe. Prior to the 2008 election, he was known to have started the Boram Sango campaign, which meant vote for ZANU-PF parliamentary candidates, but not Mugabe for the presidential candidate. General Mujuru supported Simbamakoni as president, and Simbamakoni was once a member of the ZANU-PF party, but left to form his own political party in 2008, known as Mabambo Sekusile. The Mujuru faction in ZANU-PF was known as Gamatox, named after the pesticide Gamatox. The name actually emerged because Didmas Mutasa, who was one of Joyce Mujuru's allies, said he would use it to eliminate the youthful weevils purportedly associated with Emerson Munangago. The death 
of uh, General Mujuru was a blow to the Gamatox faction. The smearing tensions erupted openly in 2014 when Grace Mugabe, Robert Mugabe's young wife, openly challenged General Mujuru's widow, Joyce Mujuru, on many fronts at the party's 2014 December Congress. This was seemingly in aid of Emerson Munangaga, then Justice Legal and Parliamentary Affairs Minister's campaign for the vice president position. Mujuru was indeed deposed. Joyce Mujuru was said to have become a too powerful force within the party. She was then accused variously of corruption, theft, and even plotting to kill Robert Mugabe, and therefore she and her followers had to go. Mujuru was paged together with eight cabinet ministers and was replaced by Emerson Mnangagwa as vice vice president of the country. By the end of 2015, the formation that went into full battle at the end of 2017 took shape. Cracks began to appear between Grace Mugabe and Emerson Mnangagwa. Accusations from the paranoid Grace Mugabe's quarters claimed that Emerson Mnangagwa and Constantine Chiwenga, Zimbabwe's army general, were already planning to dump Mugabe. At that point, two factions emerged in the Zano PF camp. The Generation 40, also known as G40 camp, supporting Mugabe, led by Grace Mugabe, Jonathan Moyo, Sevia Kasukuere, Patrick Juwao, Police Commissioner General Augustine Chuhuri, and the Director of the Central Intelligence Organization, Hepton Bonyongwe. On the other side was the faction loyal to Emerson Mnangagwa, known as Lacoste supported mainly by the war veterans and the military, with Chris Mutangwa at the helm of that faction. By 2016, the war veterans elements within the Lacoste faction, more unruly than the uniformed soldiers, were openly demonstrating against the G40, calling them the Mafiki Zolos, meaning Johnny Camletlis. Given that Robert Mugabe's constant hovering political pundits and commentators found it hard to tell which of the contending faction was ahead. By early 2017, events began to unfold and they unfolded quickly. Munangagwa flew from a Zano PF rally to a South African hospital very ill. It is believed he was poisoned after eating an ice cream laced with poison at a party rally. The increasingly power-hungry Grace Mugabe started youth interface rallies across the country, using them to insult the Lacoste members. At church gathering, she said Mnangagwa was a snake and should be hit in the head and removed. Jonathan Moyo, on the other hand, showed Politibro long videos about Munangago's indiscretions. The Lacoste faction could only reply with allegations that Jonathan Moyo was a CIA agent. On October the 10th, Central Intelligence Director Apton Bonyongwe replaced Munangagwa as Justice Minister, leaving Munangagwa with only one post as the Vice President of the country. A few days later, Robert Mugabe warned Armed Forces Commander General Konstantin Chiwenga that he should desist from anti-Grace Mugabe moves or will be killed. Chiwenga ignored his commander-in-chief. On the 4th of November, when Lacoste members of the Bulawayo crowd booed and heckled Grace Mugabe's rude behavior, Robert Mugabe suggested Mnangagwa should be fired. After sending Chiwenga to China, Mugabe fired Mnangagwa on November the 6th, and this is where it all started. 
At first, it looked like a win for the G40 faction. They planned to create three vice presidents at the December meeting with Pekezela Mpoko, Grace Mugabe, and Sidney Sekeramai, with the latter being tipped to be the next in line for the Zimbabwe presidential palace. Fired and isolated, Munangagwa fled the country to South Africa via Mozambique. Once in South Africa, he warned the G40 that he would be back soon. War veterans leader and former ambassador to China, Chris Mutranga, followed Mnangagwa into exile. From that point, we could slowly see the signs of what eventually happened that week. On November 8, war veteran head Chris Mutranga said that, and I quote, Mugabe is not owner of the party, end of quote, and called on an almost on almost every group thinkable in Zimbabwean society, churches, whites, MDC, the diaspora in South Africa, to address the menace that Zimbabwe now faces with Mugabe as a senior old man with, and I quote, a midwife. On that same day, Munangagwa released a statement saying that he had fled Zimbabwe, lashing out to his president, saying that, and I quote, the ruling Zano PF party is not personal property for you and your wife to do as you please. Mutrangwa would later become the kingmaker, apparently met with members of the white Rhodesian community who had lost land during the land redistribution exercise. It is also alleged that Mutrangwa had prepared his war veterans colleagues for such an eventuality. In fact, it seems the coup had been in the works for quite some time. Munangagwa and Chiwenga rallied the troops within a week. Chiwenga, who was in China, decided to return to Zimbabwe and risked being arrested and charged with treason by the Mugabe regime. But a cunning and strategic Chiwenga was way ahead of the regime. The police effort to arrest him on his return failed spectacularly. Army troops in civilian uniforms surrounded the aircraft and stopped the police in their tracks. More troops immobilized the police force special unit and on the 13th of November, Chiwenga issued Mugabe with an ultimatum asking him to remove the counter-revolutionary elements surrounding him and re or else the soldiers would do so. The G40 elements and Mugabe did not take Chiwenga's threat seriously as depicted by Jonathan Moyo's Zete tweet on the night of Chiwenga's speech. The next day on the 14th, Robert Mugabe and his loyal Cardas accused Chiwenga of treason. Later that very day, Operation Restore Legacy began in earnest, one of the smartest coup ever witnessed in Africa. Armed personnel carriers rolled onto the streets and sealed access to parliament, government offices, and courts in the capital Harare. Access to the presidential's official resident was also blocked by troops. The Mugabe's were put under house arrest at their Blue Roofs residence. G40 elements like Jonathan Moyo and Sevia Kasukuere are believed to have escaped to the palatial Blue Roof. The armed forces announced their action via the recently overtaken state TV. Major General Subusiso Moyo a respected veteran of many United Nations missions, denied that it was a coup. In the statement, the military said it had only taken temporal control of the country to target criminal elements around President Mugabe. They also immediately stated that Mugabe and his wife were, and I quote, safe and sound and their security guaranteed. 
finally the statement also emphasized that and i quote this is not a military takeover but an act committed to pacify a degenerating political social and economic situation in the country which if not addressed may result violent conflict many of mugabe's colleagues and friends visited the blue roof to try and persuade him to give up power they included former president of zambia dr kenneth kaunda former reserve bank of zimbabwe governor gideon gono mugabe's long time confidant roman catholic priest father fidelis mukonori ordinarily coup leaders tend to impose curfews and conduct public crackdowns to cement power after takeover instead the military leaders allowed people to demonstrate on the streets tens of thousands of anti mugabe de demonstrators took to the streets singing dancing and taking selfies with soldiers mugabe even came out to carry out public engagements a university graduation ceremony in Harare on the fourth day into the military takeover Mugabe was still president and refusing to go on the very fourth day Zanu PF his own political party removed him as its party leader and delivered an ultimatum which stated that step down by midday Monday or face impeachment later that day it was announced that Mugabe would give a speech and all expectations were that he would resign as the nation and the whole world watched Mugabe embarked upon his typical rambling address flanked by army commanders but he did not resign ending the speech with the famous Asante sana promising to chair his Politburo meeting the following day on a Monday however on the following day none of his party members attended the politburo he had called instead all parliamentarians gathered at the harare international conference center to start the impeachment process however mugabe upstaged the proceedings when the speaker announced he had received a letter in which mugabe resigned lawmakers and the nation erupted into thunderous applause and cheers as the speaker read the 20 word letter munangagwa returned thanked mugabe at his neatly prepared inaugural on the 24th of november he promised to revive the economy the opposition parties and the west we had been drooling for a government of national unity similar to the one that happened between 2009 and 2013 were left with egg on their face when the heads and opf would go into the election as soon as possible several perspectives may be used by different people to explain this november 27 zimbabwean coup what remains however is that this was indeed a unique coup Thank you for listening. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe and comment below.